Earlier this week, it was reported that the NHL has seen a massive decline in its viewership since last season. And today I want to talk about some of the things that the NHL can do and probably should be doing to reverse that problem. Hey, if you don't know me, I'm Gio. I'm a sports broadcaster and I have an extensive amount of experience in the esports space where we have basically cracked the code on appealing to Gen Z and innovating with the way to reach new audiences. So I would like to believe that I have some experience and some expertise or at least not knowledge that would be applicable to this problem that the NHL are suffering with. And I think it's something that any hockey fan has kind of been seeing happening for a little while. It's really hard to try and reach those new audiences. And for everything that this exciting fast paced game is and what it could be, it feels like it's not really reaching its full potential. So let's have a look at what the problem could be. So first of all, I just want to reference the article that actually gave a lot of these numbers just so we kind of know where we at. So the average TV audience for NHL games on ESPN and Turner stands at 373,000 viewers, down from an average of 478,000 viewers accrued at the same point last season. So that's quite a significant drop in viewership from one season to the next. Turner has seen an average audience of 359,000 viewers over 36 games, which is a 16% decrease compared to the 20 games it broadcast over the same period for the 2021 to 2022 campaign and an average of 402,000 viewers have tuned into ESPN's coverage over 18 games down 35% from the 622,000 accumulated for the seven games it showed up until the same point in 2021 to 2022. Now this article does also acknowledge the fact that both cable networks have been showing more games than they did last season and so that can be part of the reason and also the fact that there have been a lot of local blackouts uh, involved in many of their broadcasts which do become a problem and if you are somebody who spends a lot of time on social media, you will see that that seems to be one of the biggest complaints. And as an international viewer, I can also confirm that that is one of the biggest complaints. And as a European, something that I still find very hard to even understand because it's just not really something we have here. Now, I think there are a couple problems at play here. There's A, the fact that the currently already existing broadcasts are doing a subpar job of maintaining the current audience or the already existing audience, but also the fact that the NHL as a product, whether that's down to the broadcasts, the teams or whatever it is, is not doing a super good job of accumulating new viewers and that's kind of code for saying they're not really appealing to Gen Z very well. So let's tackle the first one first, and that is the fact that they're not doing a good job of maintaining the already existing fan base. Um, now, I think it's really valid for them or this article to acknowledge the fact that, um, you know, there are more broadcasts happening at the moment, which is going to mean that people watch less, which sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but it is true. Um, I think you get things like choice paralysis and you get a little bit bored. You don't want to watch everything. It is hard for people with normal lives and normal responsibilities to watch every single thing that is possibly in front of them. However, you would have thought that in theory, if everybody can't watch every game, you should still have a lot of people watching a number of those games, whether that's for the teams they're invested in, the players they're invested in, the stories they're invested in, whatever it may be, you should still have high individual viewership for each game, even if the overlap of who is watching those games is not 100%. So why might that not be the case? Well, the number one reason, and again, this is something that a lot of people have spoken about, is the lack of storylines and rivalries and really playing into that. It's the stories of sports that make people care about sports. If all you care about is watching a guy hit a puck, you could go to your local ice rink and see someone do that. Sports in and of themselves are fun to partake in, but the love of competition is something very inherent to humanity, but also being able to relate to parts of that competition and see those rivalries and see the stories and see the redemption arcs, whatever it else you want to, it, what, oh my goodness, whatever it else it is that you want to see, that is what people tune in to watch sports for. If there is a dearth of that, then people aren't going to be so inclined to do that because at the end of the day, it's it's just a hockey game and it's going to be the same as the next hockey game the next day and probably the hockey game the day after that. You need some reason to incentivize people to actually give a shit about this hockey game that's happening right now and the people who are involved in it. And of course, there will always be groups of people who will watch religiously because they are that 
extreme enthusiast end of the audience but those are not necessarily the people that you need to market for because those people can kind of be considered a given now i have a number of ideas of how to improve this sort of situation and some of them involve the way that the information is presented and the actual broadcast itself and i think that is something that i will get to a little later because it's more relevant to something else i want to talk about but one of the things that i see a lot of people talk about is how for example in hockey you see more talk of potential potential trades and things like this rather than actually what is going on. And I think that's kind of true. You know, for me, I came into hockey and, you know, I'm not an endemic hockey fan in the sense I didn't grow up with hockey. I found hockey as an adult and I fell in love with it and I really adore the sport, but it was very alien for me to kind of come into this environment where the most talked about thing is where a player could end up or which players could end up being picked up by your team and not necessarily actually what is happening with the team. It's kind of like people are very keen to talk about potential iterations of this team rather than what is being involved in the team now. And that's very strange to me. When I picked the team that I was a fan of, I became really invested in a number of those players, but that was kind of of my own volition. I went and looked into those players and decided to pay attention to what was happening with them and their personalities and who they represented on the ice. But a lot of the content surrounding the team and the news that people would talk about was not necessarily about who these players were and their stories of getting there, but rather whether these players were going to stay on the team and whether one day they'd be traded. And I think that that is a somewhat weak way of building stories because you're not really capitalizing on the very thing that people relate to. That's not to say that talk about trades and what could happen with teams isn't important. I think that's a huge part of the sport, but it's like a missed opportunity to really like lean into those things that draw people to certain players. You're going to get the players who receive a lot of praise and a lot of attention because of how good they are. We could take someone like Conor McDavid as an example. However, I wouldn't necessarily describe Conor McDavid as like the prime fountain of personality in the NHL. But when I think of players who are considered good, but really it's their personality that grips you, I think of people like Trevor Zegras or even Gets Laugh and, um, you know, Pat Maroon potentially. Like these sorts of players who you actually read Jack Hughes. He's also a good example, you know? And like those are the players that people kind of become attached to. And you see these little stories be built, but like not fully bloomed, I think. Now, this is an interesting one because when I compare this to what happens in esports, it's a lot easier to get down to that nitty gritty storytelling and the investment in players because there's more of a blurred line between the players and the audience. In esports, you see uh, players very, very frequently interact with the audience, whether that's through social media, through streaming, uh, whatever it is, it, there's not such a distance between player and fan. Um, and I don't expect that to change in sports just because that's kind of the way it is, but it does mean that there's more of an onus on the broadcast and on the organization as well themselves to be selling the stories of those players because the players aren't necessarily going to do it themselves and i think that for me as somebody who is very well acquainted with how that's done in esports i can see such a gap between the level of intensity and and relation that the audience feels uh between each other. Now, I wanna also talk about this blackout thing as well as one of these, um, you know, potential factors. Um, and this is just, this is crazy to me. And this might be a cultural thing, but I kind of don't care. I think the idea of there being blackouts because of local and regional markets is a really, really antiquated idea. Um, it's also a very North American thing and it makes sense because it is a huge market and a huge, physically huge country where person who's living in upstate New York and person who's living in Southern California are in two different universes. But in the world of social media and the world of the internet and the world where your universe, your personal universe and the things you care about and the people that you care about and what's relevant in your life extends beyond just your hometown and your immediate environment, I don't think this is a relevant uh, kind of format anymore. And the problem with it is it encourages piracy. And so it could could even be that the viewership for the NHL may be going up, but so many of those people are pirating 
the views. If there is not a feasible way for people to be able to access the content that they are interested in, then they're just not going to. They're not going to pay for it. They're not going to like try and act. They'll, they will either do it illegally or they won't do it at all. And I think it is wrong as a system and a format to kind of be told which teams you have the option to watch based on where you live. Um, now, this is not me saying that all regional broadcasts should be axed or cancelled or, or hoping that this is going to change the whole system, but I think it is something that needs to be acknowledged. And I think that the modernization of the broadcasting is something that will have to be a serious consideration at some point. For example, and this is bleeding a little bit into where I want to go with my next point about how to access a younger uh, audience um, metric, because I think this is very relevant to that as well. But for example, you you know, having broadcast rights be given to more digital platforms. I know that Amazon Prime um, has a lot of sports broadcasting these days. Uh, they do, I think, Thursday Night Football. Could be wrong on that one. They also do the English Premier League as as a, an official broadcaster. Um, so Amazon Prime is a really good example of one. But even if you were to sell broadcast rights to, for example, YouTube, where you have a huge already existing audience um there is a very valid potential revenue stream either through youtube premium or through advertising i mean if you want good advertising google is basically the number one spot for that um and you have access to demographics who probably aren't paying for cable <laughs> and the thing as well with blackouts is it ties into that previous point too where it's really hard to build holistic stories because you have supposedly no idea whatever the hell is going on on the other side of the country or in this other division or whatever like your team's gonna be playing uh like fucking whoever else from three million time zones away oh cool i guess i'll just rely on like the fun facts that i'm told in the broadcast because i don't know anything about that team because i can't watch their games i think setting these restrictions on your audience and on your potential audience you want to tap into is already such a huge, huge issue with regards to trying to maintain or grow that audience. And you know, it's crazy to me as a European where so many of the of the NHL players are from my continent. And yet, if I want to watch the NHL, I kind of can't really do that because I don't live in America or Canada. <laughs> there is always still going to be that core audience that these regional broadcasts can reach but even if like i don't know let's say ali sports west who cover like the la kings if they start doing like a lot more digital stuff or whatever that can be accessed by people outside of that market so there's ways around blackouts but even then you have to contend with this idea of like okay if i have to pay a subscription to this and a subscription to this and a subscription to this i think focusing less on this regional network kind of system um, and trying to modernize that into something where um, maybe you can pay for whichever teams that you want to have access to or whatever it is, there's a lot more digital options for broadcast rights. I think that's something that's going to have to very seriously be looked at because in the last... 15 years the world has changed a lot with regards to how people consume content how they like to consume sports how they like to consume their media how they like to consume their news and the truth is tv kind of just ain't it <laughs> anymore so let's talk about this idea with regards to reaching new audience and uh really what that means like i said at the beginning is you want to tap into gen z now i myself am not gen z i'm like the like the baby millennial um but i obviously work with a lot of gen z i consume a lot of content that is aimed at gen z and my whole area of work really comes down to marketing towards gen z um now i have this forbes article here uh which has this interesting stat which says gen z make up about 40% of global consumers and much of their life takes place online. And then it says, in fact, Zoomers have a particular relationship with digital technology being more digitally savvy than any previous generation. This demographic of consumers is especially conscious of sensitive social issues and the environment. So that 
is kind of one of those things that's important to that generation. For brands to successfully market to Zoomers, they must have a positive digital presence and equally important, convey social awareness. The companies that appeal most to Generation Z are those that proudly stand for social values aligning with overall consumer sentiment. So this kind of hits on two really important things that I think are important to discuss here. And that is that A, Gen Z is a huge market that predominantly exists in the digital space and B, one of the really important things about marketing to Gen Z is about what you as an entity stand for. Um, and that latter one is a little bit tongue in cheek, I would say, because um, the NHL is not free of controversy and certainly hasn't been in recent history. Um, and I think that there have been uh, <laughs> some attempts that require improvement um, in how they deal with unsavory situations i'm not really here to kind of like talk a ton about like all of the social problems with hockey and these embedded issues and whatever but you know looking at things like the hockey canada controversy that happened which yes is not in and of itself the nhl but it's part of the same universe it is clear that there are a lot of issues that do need fixing and do need solving and um controversy after controversy erodes pr sentiment Let's just leave it there. Clearly, PR sentiment is going to be an important thing. That needs to be fixed, but that is its whole own thing. And what I really want to focus on here is the point about not only Gen Z being a huge consumer base, but also the fact that they are really like digital. Um, and again, so much of this um, way of marketing and broadcasting hockey comes down to local TV markets. Um, and that's just not going to work for this generation. Now, that's not to say do a TikTok live stream of, um, of the NHL. I don't, I don't think any sport has gotten to the point where they're live streaming on TikTok quite yet. Um, but like I said before, I do think that trying to attain some kind of broadcast rights deal potentially with an online platform would be something that's beneficial. Um, now, I mentioned YouTube before because I do think that YouTube is probably a more sustainable platform than, for example, Twitch. Um, Twitch is a little bit it's had its issues over time with regards to figuring out the best way of making money and the best way of being super profitable. One of the problems that kind of arrives from Twitch is the fact that Twitch has always been free and it gets very hard to figure out how to ask people to pay money for something that has always been free. Um, and that's a problem that esports broadcasts are kind of facing where like broadcast rights is not such a big thing in esports because they have this free platform. Now, YouTube is obviously free as well, but YouTube has a much, much better advertising system than Amazon does because, I mean, ads is basically how Google makes all of its money. Um, and YouTube premium is a thing. And even if I, I actually don't know what the, the statistics are for Gen Z's sort of as part of the YouTube premium subscription um, demographic, but because a lot of Gen Z is going to be really native to YouTube as a platform because they consume a lot of content there, um, they are probably more likely to be converted into paying customers um, if you can... Uh, kind of access them on that platform. I think a really interesting sort of um, potential middle ground is similar to kind of what the NWSL does, where the NWSL broadcasts some of their games on Twitch. And so you have that kind of entry point where it's free to see, it's on a platform that's endemic to uh, a younger, more digital audience. And if you can get their interest from that, then you may convert them down the line. And that's kind of the basis of marketing, right? But that is a marketing um, sort of project or aim that it has really sort of tapped into what it is that this target demographic does endemically. And that's something that I think the NHL have not done or have not yet fully embraced or tried to do. Uh, there's digital content, like the NHL has a TikTok page, but talking about the actual broadcast itself. And again, like that kind of ease of access and the accessibility is like me as a foreigner, I, I can't really access um, NHL <laughs> broadcasts. But if I could just get a YouTube subscription or whatever it is. And that, you know, that would maybe be something that I'm a lot more inclined to do. The other interesting thing as well with a platform like YouTube and indeed even Twitch is you have that live chat experience, which is such 
it's such a cultural part of the live streaming experience uh, these days, especially with the growth from Justin TV into Twitch and just live streaming being such a ubiquitous and actually also lucrative um, part of just cultural media consumption now. Um, being able to have that alongside watching your favorite sport in the same way that you do have in, alongside watching your favorite eSport, that it's such a, uh, it, it breeds a sense of cultural solidarity. And so you get a lot of in-jokes, you get a lot of memes, um, you get this feeling of actually being involved. You're not watching through a glass window, you are an active part of this activity. And, and that is also something that sells really well to Gen Z that I think the NHL could benefit from. I found this really interesting graph. Um, it was actually from a, uh, a Medium article, but this graph has been credited to Morning Consult and it's titled Gen Z less interested in most sports properties than the general public. And it's really interesting interesting here how we can see a number of different sports um, and where Gen Z kind of compare to the majority of adults. So Gen Z still have a pretty high interest in the NFL compared to all adults. Um, anecdotally, I would assume that part of that is a partially due to the NFL's ubiquity, but also because there is a real generational aspect there that I have noticed in uh, my kind of American friends is that like your parents are probably a fan and if your parents are a fan you will have been raised a fan it's very similar to how football like soccer is here in the UK um my parents are not soccer fans so I was not raised a soccer fan but I know a lot of people who are huge soccer fans because they grew up in soccer families but interesting here that the NHL is the penultimate um sport listed here where only 25 percent of gen zers uh have an interest in the nfl and that is significantly further below esports which is 35 percent and actually esports is the one where you have the biggest difference between gen z and all adults with 35 percent com compared to the 19 percent for all adults so it massively overshadows all adults whereas in the nhl it is significantly lower than what all adults are. And that is, is a quantitative proof that the NHL is failing to market towards Gen Z and either don't know how to do that or up until this point haven't cared. Um, and I think that this is uh, a problem because there will come a point where that that is the market they need to be interested in their product. And it's also frustrating because anybody who's a fan of hockey knows what a fast paced, exciting game it is. You know, like I feel like with football, if you don't or like grow up knowing football, football is slow, it is incredibly analytical and it's very hard to watch if you don't know the game. Um, but hockey's not really. It's just all like move fast, hit puck in goal. That is accessible. It's an accessible game in terms of the ability to watch it. And that's why football is so popular. Now, obviously, football is a little, uh, uh, soccer is so popular. Soccer is a little bit more popular because the accessibility to play it is a lot higher than, um, than hockey is. Hockey being very expensive and obviously seasonally dependent in, in a lot of cases. But also, we have this in, in esports as well, you know, where like one of the biggest esports in the world is Counter Strike. And the reason that Counter Strike as an esport is so popular is because anybody can watch it. It's so easy to watch and understand what's happening, even if you've never played the game before. And hockey kind of is that. And so it shouldn't be fledgling like this. Now, one of the things that has worked really well in esports that I think is super important to bring up here and that I think could be made use of better by the NHL is the co-streaming phenomenon. Now, this is not completely unknown to the NHL because um, Steve Dangle very famously co-streams alongside Sportsnet for the Toronto Maple Leafs games. Um, and this is something which has really changed the game in esports. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar, co-streaming is when influencers, streamers, whatever it is, individuals who are not part of the official broadcast or part of the sport necessarily are given the rights to stream the uh, the game on their own channel and kind of give their own commentary and make their own kind of show about it so it'll usually be like you know if i'm a co-streamer i'll be sat here in my bedroom like i'll literally be right here and i'll be watching alongside my audience who will have access to the live chat they can talk to me about it we can all like enjoy it together and that is so undeniably popular oh my god like 
you would have to be an idiot to, to not um, acknowledge how popular that is. And there have been um, cases in esports over the last few years where a broadcast has tried to deny the opportunity to have co-streaming. And there's been so much audience backlash because it's so incredibly popular. So for example, I got a couple of articles up here. Dot Esports at the beginning of the year reported that Ebuy, who is one of the biggest streamers in the world, and I think the biggest Spanish speaking streamer, um, he had co-streaming rights to stream the LEC, which is the League of Legends European Championship. Um, from the beginning of this year. So this is from January, I think. And he, on his own stream, eclipsed 100,000 viewers. Now that still counts towards the official viewership of the league when they give a lot of their information, like they provide the co-streaming numbers as well. Um, and that is nuts. But so many of those people who are watching that are people who are non-endemic to league of legends let's say so a number of those people will just be fans of him and they kind of come in using him as a conduit and that's why for a lot of esports um for major major events like really big events um you'll find that a lot of uh games publishers will bring in co-streamers who do not typically stream their game um the idea being that they're tapping into a market that they don't currently have access to um so valorant very famously in 2020 when they had their first strike um event and this is you know this is the first year of valorant existing as a game they hired both ninja and myth um who are huge streamers to co-stream the event now there were some people who weren't happy about that because neither of those streamers were like endemically valorant but the whole idea is that they would far, you know, reach an audience that the game itself would not reach on its own. Now, I know that Steve Dangle's co-streams are pretty popular and he does them for Sportsnet. So even then there is this difference where he's not doing them on his own channels. He's built his own reputation and whatever on his channel, but Sportsnet actually hire him to do it on their channel. So it's still the broadcast network that's making money from that. And I think that's quite like a cool little compromise that works very well for the sports industry as opposed to the esports industry. Um, and I think it, 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 it's also, it's just people like it. You know, you could get a figurehead like Nasha, for example, who, you know, he has just been invited Along some other pe alongside some other people to uh, the NHL All-Stars. And there is everywhere on social media just all of these kids who are so fucking excited specifically to meet Nasha. Um, and that is such a golden opportunity. Like, get... I actually don't know who has the broadcast rights for the Columbus Blue Jackets, but whoever that is, get them to bring him in and uh, co-stream, like, their games. Like, even if you just do, like, once a week or something like that, it doesn't have to be every single game, but that would just be an insane way to bring in that next generation. You kidding me? Like it's a honeypot, it's right there. No, it is really interesting because I find that there <laughs> just culturally in sports is a little bit less of an understanding about what co-streaming even is or where the value is. Um, I read this article last week from Broadcast Now and it was sort of reporting on this round table amongst sports professionals, executives, whatever. Um, and it's called How Rights Holders Should Approach Content. And in that article, um, they spoke, or the round table rather, they spoke about co-streaming and they were like, oh, you know, this is like a really interesting idea. And I was kind of reading this and I was thinking, this has existed for years in esports. And it's very strange watching all these executives talk about it as if it's a very new concept. It's not, it's really not. And that in and of itself is an indictment for perhaps how behind the sports industry is but uh, you know some of them were talking about you know there's like the brand risk of like um you know what if they say something we don't like um now obviously there's always the risk of that anytime that a brand works with a content creator but content marketing or uh you know influencer marketing sorry has been already i think like pretty globally acknowledged as one of the most effective ways at marketing to a certain generation of people that you kind of can't really escape that um and the risk is low enough that you like the amount of money that you can make from it is just it blows it out of the water and the thing is like 
when it comes to working with brands, you know, as an influencer, you get given your list of things that you should or shouldn't say, can or can't say, whatever. If you if, if the influencer breaks that, or if the influencer does something controversial and risks your brand image or whatever it is, they pretty much get blacklisted. Like no brand's gonna wanna work with them again. And those things are fairly easy to overcome, you know? And we even see that with celebrities. I'm not gonna name celebrities who recently have lost major brand deals for doing some really heinous shit. You know, you could think that that is safe and and one of them one day comes out and does all this crazy shit. So like there is always that risk, but the risk isn't high and the risk is also not so threatening to your brand that you wouldn't be able to overcome it. And you're putting a, you're leaving a lot of money on the table to um, retreat into the fear of that risk rather than embrace the opportunity but i also think as with any business relationship there has to be a certain level of trust and there also has to be a slight relinquishment of the sort of safety net of like what is corporately okay um you know if you are working with an influencer who makes their own video content or they're a streamer like they should be allowed to swear, you know, maybe not excessively, like whatever, whatever, like for your brand, what, you know, whatever, like the boundary is there. But like, as soon as you start applying tons of rules onto what the influencer can or cannot do, you are eroding where the value in that influencer is in the first place. And you're really diluting and sterilizing that. And the audience are going to not care about the content and not going to want to engage in the content because they can tell it's inauthentic. You know, I've seen this a lot of times before where people get given so many rules from brands who want to work with them and then they try and um change the way they've edited their content and change all their thumbnails and change the way they present it and write copy for them for them to like post on social media that's not in their voice and it sounds very corporate and people switch off instantly instantly and so there has to be this i think this is the frustrating thing is you get a lot of these c-suite execs who sort of like sniff this idea of like, oh, well, you know, like working with influencers could be cool or like, what is this co-streaming? I've never heard of this. And then there isn't anybody there as part of the company who actually natively understands what those things are and how to really activate that kind of marketing. And so you end up with this real mess that comes in the middle. And this is something where I think that gap needs to be bridged because it's such a huge opportunity um and i think that that is an incredible way to convert a lot of new fans especially in a generation that simply is not a major part of your demographic it's also a generation that spends a lot of money ultimately i love the nhl and uh i'm very very passionate about how to reach these new audiences i'm passionate about content i'm passionate about how to market to these uh these people and as a as a sports broadcaster myself and somebody who spends my whole life on camera um and especially in a scene where this is kind of our bread and butter i feel like i have this really unique perspective that i can kind of bring over into this world of hockey to try and say hey look here are the things that will work for us here are the things that that really like get to that audience that you want use them here is my free consultation you know take it but i'd love to hear you guys thoughts if you made it this far um and just hopefully we start seeing some big improvements because i love this sport and i really want to see it transition into the next era and the next generation and just maybe stop holding itself back and being so afraid of what it has to do in order to get there um, but thank you guys so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.